Hi everybody, this is Jill Hobson again, uh, Institutional Program Manager with IMS Global. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for the second in our K-12 webinar series, Leading the Digital Evolution. Today's session is Taking the First Steps to Student-Centered Learning. We'll be getting started here in one second. So I'd like to let you know that the next webinar in the series is Making Digital Content Discoverable, and we hope you'll join us for that one as well as the rest of the webinars in this series that happen throughout 2017. So just a little bit of background on IMS Global. We are a collaborative of member organizations. Uh, we have members from all over the world, K-12, higher ed, and suppliers. Together, this group collaborates to find ways to use technology to improve learning. To do this, we focus on plug and play environments using tools and strategies that enable rapid improvement in the learning environment. We want to make you aware that there that this collaborative of members has made resources available for school districts that are great for you to use as you attempt, begin to look into ways that you can make a plug and play environment for your school district. We encourage you to visit imsglobal.org slash k12 to learn more. Now I'd like to introduce today's guest speakers. We have Mike Chiquetti from Volusia County Schools in Florida. Mike is the Learning Technologies Coordinator there. And we have Mike Evans. From Forsyth County Schools in Georgia, Mike is the Chief Technology and Information Officer there. I'm going to invite each guest to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their district and make some opening remarks regarding their digital learning environment and the steps that they are taking to simplify the process of creating user accounts and rostering teachers and students into classes for the various next generation learning systems applications and content providers that they use. With that said, I'll be turning it over to Mike Chiquetti to begin his presentation. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Kara. Thank you, IMS Learning Council and Colson. I uh, appreciate the time being here and all the participants that are joining us today. I'm uh, Mike Chiquetti, Coordinator for Learning Technologies in Volusia County Schools. Uh, we are located in Central Florida on the East Coast. We are one of the largest employers in the county with over 8,000 staff members and 63,000 plus students. We have over 80 school sites, including charter and alternative education. Uh, Volusia County Schools has undergone a uh, major district department restructure over the course of the last two years. Let me throw that up real quick. Uh, with our new superintendent, Mr. James T. Russell, uh, he has three guiding principles for our district that we all reside and live by, and that's one, a dedication to increase student achievement, a commitment to finding solutions to problems, and mutual respect and positive relationships with all stakeholders. And three focus areas to prioritize our work to uphold the guiding principles. Those are to build a culture for learning, make the instructional shifts, and personalize learning. Since the restructure and reprioritization of our district's focus, the Technology Services and Innovation Department, which Learning Technology is a part of, led by Dr. Melissa Carr, has ramped up our efforts and vision to perform as the industry leader in technology information and innovation. Leveraging technology and information to support superior learning opportunities is our mission. Going back to 2011-2012, when I joined the district as a specialist for learning technologies, digital resources were minimal, but very important for our customers. That's going back to even when we had overhead projectors and the clear transparencies. We all love them. Uh, through the years, our resources have grown in quadruple, and the amount uh, from where we started. Altogether, we have close to 100 digital resources and we're climbing, with most requiring accounts and rostering of teachers and students. 
When I started, we had to load each resource with its own specific CSV file. Some allowed for nightly or weekly uploads to mitigate the time for new accounts to process, while others required secure FTPs had to be set up and tested. As many of you know, this process is what led many of us to go bald and or seek shelter from instructional staff inquiring about the availability of their resources. It's a little bit laughable today, but it was not laughable back when time was, and we still have vendors that are going about that way. Today, we have a dedicated staff member who works closely with our tech services and innovation department, as well as instructional services department and subdivisions such as ESE and Title I. We implemented a single sign-on portal four years ago and have since moved to a new vendor, ClassLink, as our SSO provider. Since joining IMS Global, switching to ClassLink and adopting an LMS, along with our district's restructure, uh, BCS has been able to open the conversation door with all vendors, both existing or not yet known, to require that the IMS standards are complied with and ready. Collaborating with districts through other memberships and groups has also allowed BCS to be confident in our decisions on vendors, requirements, and discussions with interdepartmental groups and schools. Switch back over here. Some of our goals that we've outlined in, in the, uh, the state of Florida, we have a digital classroom plan that we submit each year to the state of Florida. And we outline goals that we consistently uh, look back on, reflect, and adjust. And so our goals at the moment are increased opportunities for personalized learning. At least 80% of our teachers report at it being an adoption level or higher on the TIM. The TIM is the Technology Integration Matrix developed out of the Uni uh, University of South Florida from Dr. James Welch. Our third goal is students will have one-to-one -one access to a device with any time, anywhere connectivity. Fourth goal is 80% of our eighth grade students will earn a digital tool certificate. And that's a real big push starting from last year moving into next year. And our final goal was 100% access to digital materials and performance data from a fully integrated system. That's over the course of the next four years until that 2019, 2020 year. We feel there are four goals that our department in learning technologies and technology service and innovation can help address to guide those digital classroom plan goals. One is, and one that we can all agree on, it's to train all adults on how to personalize learning through the integration of technology. It's pedagogy first, technology second. And we stand by that and we will have those conversations with um, any stakeholder as we, as we uh, have those discussions. We shift toward digital content in all content areas. We expand our infrastructure for anytime, anywhere access, and we make, it, uh, we make access equitable for every student to a technology device. Some of our target, target audiences that we worked with through this year and um, stemming into last year as well, bringing in our groups, we had to speak with administrators, teachers, and students. We had to get the buy-in from those that are on the ground level as well as our district and support staff, along with community members and different activity groups inside of Lucia County so that everyone was aware of our goals, our mission, our vision, and had input as to where we should move. And this is consistently moving forward, and we look to revisit those focus groups year in and year out. Some of the outcomes, four major outliers that came about from uh, the majority of the focus groups that we did for the last two years. One is that they feel professional development and teacher training are essential as we move forward in the digital realm. One-to-one -one should look different, and that should vary by school and grade levels. It should not be a one-size-fits-all approach. Teacher readiness should be considered to some degree. And this one brought about a lot of discussion, and the discussion around teacher readiness was really, as you deploy technology, as we look to implement digital resources, is it only geared toward those that are ready, those that are smiling, jumping up and down with their hands? Or do we make it so those that are jumping up, ready and, ready and willing, can also work and collaborate with those in the same teams and or across district to build that confidence? So when technology is in, a, let's say, a third grade classroom, we ensure that the fourth grade classroom is ready for the students to come up that next year. What that will help mitigate is students using technology effectively for one year and moving on and asking where it is. And the last one was obviously to keep up with the refresh plan and support structure for all teacher and student devices. To keep that year in, year out 
refresh plan so that way technology is never a burden, but it's only something that can be used to enhance what is going on in instruction. Our rollout for one-to-one -one may look a little different from many districts and many schools uh, across the nation and across the world, um, but when we did the evaluation and we did our focus groups to find out where we wanted to go as a district, uh, we felt it was best to do our deployments in waves to allow for the pedagogy shift to occur prior to the technology arriving so we weren't chasing the ball, we were rather kicking it up that hill and making it a lot, a lot more effective um, during the rollout. We weren't backtracking as much. So thus far, you're seeing a snapshot of what occurred through the fall and winter and what's currently occurring in the summer going into this fall for 2017. And that will continue in the same wave of a fall, some, summer, spring uh, deployment in that we ensure the technology that's going out, the discussions that are occurring with our administrators um, are making sure technology is being used in the manner that is effectively um, increasing instruction for our students, not just a very nice shiny tool inside the room. We did involve through our digital classroom plan a DLTL, as we refer to them, or a digital learning teacher leader on every campus. This role is typically leveraged by a supplement towards a media specialist or someone that was identified by the principal as a technology leader in pedagogy and use case, as well as someone who can have that open conversation with anyone in and around themselves. And these are some of their, some of their roles at the moment, and just something that helps us have uh, someone on some foot on the ground as we expand our uh, trainings inside and out uh, for our district. One thing I think that's unique about Volusia County, as I talk a lot with other districts and surrounding districts, um, is we have a standing appointment at every administrator, both principal and assistant principal meetings each month, as well as our instructional services group. So technology services and innovation and my department alone, learning technologies, sits with our principals and APs as well as IS each month and we have open conversations around technology deployment, around technology effectiveness, uh, where they would like to go. We, we uh, included the word innovation in our title last year because we truly wanted to have the questions addressed that were coming up uh, day in and day out, not just from principals but also from our, our staff that are in the, in the classroom with our students. Uh, an equation for success, uh, what we felt that we have in place at the moment, we've adopted an LMS, uh, we have a single sign-on port, uh, portal, we do have a cloud-hosted solution for our online storage, uh, share and collaborate uh, product, which is Office 365, and we're currently in the process of developing an RFP for a new SIS system. That along with access to technology, we believe will allow us to have an effect, efficient and effective digital ecosystem, and that in itself will allow for instruction to occur and move forward. A uh, couple of resources, I'm gonna share this link, it's also on the page at the moment, but I'll share this in the chat uh, window. We're, we're building for our staff in Volusia County as we roll out technology and as we look to adopt new resources that align to IMS standards and align to uh, where we want to go in the industry for education, especially in K-12, we developed a one-to-one -one acceleration resource. And in this, this is an open Canvas course that I'll share with everyone. We basically branched it out into four quadrants. If you were just getting new technology and you're not super comfortable with it, this is a great resource to get you started so you don't have to wait for let's say a monthly meeting and you have to wait two to three weeks in, until that occurs. It's something available and it's at any time and anywhere for you to access, as well as those that are very comfortable and just wanna know a little bit more, or maybe weren't aware of one resource specifically that was there and available and it just wasn't uh, right, right in front of their face at the moment. So we broke it into four quadrants, getting to know your tech, essential skills for digital learning, that's the pedagogy shift in using technology, not necessarily say, stating the tool, but what is your purpose and intention of using technology in the classroom. Along with CHAMPS, we use CHAMPS for the digital classroom. That allows the classroom management piece to be taken into consideration as students have technology both in BYOT classrooms as well as what's district provided. And lastly, digital citizenship, which is a large portion of what we're doing inside of the county at the moment. 
So just a couple snapshots inside, but I'll share this resource. We break it down by hardware and operating system. You know, that can be a confusing question from a majority of first-time users to technology. I have a question with my, my laptop, but is it a button question and or an operating system question? So we try to help align um, their thoughts so that way support tickets and so on can be addressed in a much more timely manner than having to uh, call back out or send more emails as for, uh, for clarification. Um, and inside, we'll spell out each and every model that we have available or that they would come in contact with inside of our campuses. This is both helpful for those that are existing in our district and those that we're looking to begin hiring come the next hiring phase. So that way, as they step foot in a Volusia County classroom, they're aware of the, the models that we support, what's available, and even just their names. So again, if there is a ticket or a question, uh, they're not asking for the blue cart or the gray cart. They have a name to go along with the face and then the operating system, and so on. Last thing, and then I'll switch the ball. Um, what's next? What we're looking to do with our success that we've had with our DLTLs, our Digital Learning Teacher Leaders, one on every campus, although it's a stipend position, it is a position that requires time, and time is always of the essence, and time is always the factor that we look to address, and that's what the benefits of the IMS standards allows for as well, we open up time for our students and teachers as we address these standards. But moving forward, we're looking to expand not the DLTL role, but bring it into more of a digital learning coaching role um, at the district level and expand each year as we move towards one-to-one -one access. So that way we're bridging the effectiveness that we can have with pedagogy and the instructional value of using technology. So all that, the steps will climb up and we'll have a little rocky jumping up at the top kind of the idea. Um, so that's just a little bit about us and a little bit on the slides, but I'll share in the chat window a little link that you can also take, uh, take back and, and look to address. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Um, just as you're passing the ball over, let me ask you to um, answer one quick question that came up, and that was the number of students in your system. Yes. Number of students is 63,000 plus. So we keep climbing. Perfect, thanks. And with that, we will pass it to Mike Evans. Mike, take it away. Thank you, Jill. And uh, thanks, Mike, and appreciate everyone spending the little bit of time this afternoon with us as we're sharing a little bit our dis about our districts and what's going on. Um, I'm Mike Evans uh, with Forsyth County Schools. Um, Forsyth County is located in the nice, warm, well, normally warm, today it was down in the 20s, uh, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. Um, we are a growing district, currently serving about 46,500 students. We've been increasing on average over the last few years at about 4% um, each year, and uh, constantly building schools as well. Um, we currently uh, have 21 elementary, 10 middle, and 5 high schools. Um, we open up an elementary and middle this year and uh, are currently building a new high school as well as a Career Tech Academy uh, that will open in August of 2018. Uh, in addition to the brick and mortar, we also have a, um, two alternative schools as well as one virtual school that ser serves students in grades 6 through 12 throughout our district. Uh, a little bit more about our district. Um, we have uh, currently implementing for this coming up school year uh, a Chromebook rollout of about 25,000 Chromebooks, uh, trying to meet the needs of getting 10 per classroom. Uh, we've been a BYOT district uh, for, ooh, I would say, over about 10 years now within our district, uh, allowing students to bring their own devices in. Uh, they connect to a, uh, an open uh, but filtered wireless network that we have uh, for the students to connect with. And one of the other things that we are, uh, that we've been focusing on as well is uh, digital equity, uh, trying to meet the needs of the low income families uh, in the district that might not have internet access or uh, computers at home. So we have a uh, digital equity task force that meets and uh, we raise money to provide internet access through hotspots at student homes. 
Uh, also looking at this year is additionally providing uh, more devices for the students um, with multiple children in the home as well. So that they can, instead of sharing a, a laptop or computer, that they'll have uh, more robust access availability. Uh, throughout our district, we partner with the community. We've created a directory of um, many areas throughout our town uh, that offer free Wi-Fi in the area. So that's one of the areas or one of the ways that we're trying to meet the needs as well uh, for those families that are out and about or don't have access. Or unfortunately, because we are in a rural area and we do have some uh, some hilly uh, terrain, uh, some of the, the hot spots don't meet the needs of all of those families. So also providing areas that they can get on the Internet and access school resources along the way. We have a district-wide focus that has been on personalized learning. Uh, and I think as you go out and you listen to different webinars and, and talks and you read about personalized learning, uh, that seems to be the largest discussion that's going on right now, or one of the largest ones. Uh, for us as a district, it really means for us changing the instructional strategies that are going on in the classroom. Uh, so really trying to identify ways to meet the individual student needs, uh, student choice and voice uh, engagement as well. Um, and regarding our partnership with IMS Global, we've been um, partnering with IMS Global for probably about eight years now. Um, and that started uh, uh, many, uh, many years ago when our former leadership um, took on the initiative to start addressing some of the needs of interoperability uh, with our vendors uh, and providing letters with them, letting them know that if they're not moving forward in the direction uh, that's needed, then we'll look at cutting ties with them. Uh, since then, uh, glad to say most of the vendors have jumped on board. We did uh, cut ties with um, some that did not and had no future plans of moving in those directions. So, um, so the partnership that we've had with IMS uh, has been uh, really successful and uh, benefited our district along the way as well. So looking at it as a district, you can pretty much look at this uh, sign and place any, uh, any person, whether that's a student, teacher, administrator, at the bottom of these signs and let them follow the random path up uh, to try to access their platforms, content, and resources. That's something that we've struggled with, the siloed effect for many years, trying to find ways that we can streamline that process uh, for students and teachers um, so that they're not going to multiple places across the board. Uh, we've had a learning management system in our year in our district for uh, over 12 years. Um, most recently, and we've been with its learning for about four years now. And with the partnership with IMS, we've been able to to work with our vendors and our content providers to start to streamline that process, so that really we're at the point where we have one single place for them to go uh, to get to that point. Um, we needed a more integrated approach, not only for ease of use, but also for efficiency. Uh, when we're listening to the students or the teachers talking about how much time they're wasting, um, signing out or, or clicking on a link only to have to sign into another application to access a resource, um, that's, a, that's a difficult path that we've had and that we've tried to overcome. Uh, so we've, we're at the point right now that within uh, its learning, our teachers were able to uh, connect the, the pieces together. Um, students are going there on a daily basis. The teachers' lesson plans are all contained within our learning management system. And uh, to the point where even on our um, snow days, we've, we've removed our snow days from our calendar, inclement weather days. And uh, so when we have to close school for one reason or another, uh, we've had it twice this year already, and we have in online learning days instead now. Um, so that has really, um, we've only been able to do that because of the, the current status of where we are, where everyone is relying on um, accessibility uh, to get them where they need to go, to make sure that everything works well and that it's consistent along the way. A uh, current example of what a, a traditional classroom may look like from our teacher's pr perspective. Uh, the teachers are the ones we're hearing most from, and that's the fact that they have so many things that are going into their lessons, which is fabulous. That's what we want them to do. We want them to engage the students with, uh, with a variety of resources, um, strategies, instructional tools, um, that we want to make sure that, that things can connect to a certain point, um, that we're removing all of those barriers along the way. 
So what we have uh, transitioned to, uh, I'll let you know the current status of, of how we're doing things within our district. Uh, number one, we wanted to make sure that, that access is readily, readily available um, to the platforms. So uh, as a district, we also have partnered with ClassLink to be our single sign-on uh, portal. So all students go to one specific place to access those resources. Uh, this is an example of our, our, one of our school's websites, Johns Creek Elementary. They have a link at the top of their page right, to direct them to ClassLink uh, in its learning. Uh, and also on the district main page on the district website, we have a link as well, as well. So at any point, whether it's a student, teacher, or a parent, they have e easily accessible um, paths to get to where they need to go to. Um, once they access that point, We've uh, created an Active Directory federated search page within our district. This is the initial point that actually starts the process going of that single sign-on access. Uh, once we get through this point, then that launches them and lands them within our uh, ClassLink portal. Uh, I know there are some other districts out there that have created their own um, and will be looking at different options along the way, but I've got to tell you from all the different components um, and initiatives that we've done across our district, uh, the feedback that we've had from teachers and students alone on this one component of generating one single place, one single sign-on, and single resource for them to go to has received the most positive feedback that we've had um, in a long time. Uh, they were clamoring for a way to really remove all of those barriers, uh, and so we've received some fabulous uh, support um, with this uh, particular piece that would allow the single sign-on piece with the um, LTI connections and the SAML connections that will generate that, uh, that piece that they're looking for. So one of the uh, other areas that we've been benefiting from with IMS uh, standards is also with the LTI tools. Within its learning, uh, we have had a variety of, uh, of needs to integrate tools directly within our learning management system. So um, we've worked with It's Learning. They're also uh, IMS Global uh, Partners to uh, integrate LTI tools directly within the platform. One of the things that, uh, that teachers are able to do is directly um, add a specific LTI tool um, resource within their classroom. Currently, we, um, we utilize Destiny, Safari, and VoiceThread within uh, these components. So they can actually generate resources uh, and activities uh, directly uh, associated to the lesson plans that they're doing. Uh, some of the activities will actually return, uh, do a return trip as well uh, into the components. And that's one of the key things that we're looking for as a district is um, how can we set up these specific configurations for the teachers to use uh, and again, same terminology, removing the barriers for them. Uh, at a district level, we can also set up LTI tools, so there's some flexibility from that standpoint. Uh, thin common cartridge uh, has been another key area that we've been working for along the way. Um, so this is an example of a screenshot uh, from uh, Houghton Mifflin uh, cartridge, an Algebra I uh, cartridge that we looked at piloting with them. Um, Within the, the, the lore, the library, the content repository, whatever the terminology you may, you may use, one of the things that our teachers and our students want is they want that one single place to go to. Uh, if a teacher is looking uh, at uh, a specific, for a specific lesson or a video on molecules or atoms, um, and they go to that repository uh, to look and find things, um, we currently support district and teacher created resource sharing uh, as well as other components that are um, that are supported within its learning um, through uh, the pieces that they subscribe to or they partner with such as guru but our key thing really is coming down to uh, trying to get the vendors um, to work together our content providers and our learning management systems to work together so that our teachers truly can just go to that one single place to make sure that they can uh, capitalize on uh, the resources being in one, one location. Uh, in this specific example with a thin common cartridge, this was uh, importing the uh, Houghton Mifflin Algebra 1 cartridge uh, into a course, and then these can actually be shared back out into that library for any teachers to use and define. So you can see um, uh, 
over on the right hand side, this is an example of our library search where where it yields a specific um, uh, author as Houghton Mifflin along the way. Um, the difference between the two with it being a thin common cartridge is once this is actually accessed um, and, and loaded into a course when a student or teacher launches it, the content is still going to reside on Houghton Mifflin servers as opposed to directly within its learning. Um, so the thin common cartridge uh, is one area that has been beneficial for us. Um, you know, from a, from a district perspective, we're still working with the content providers to make sure that uh, the content packages that, that they are um, creating are down to that granular level. Uh, as you can notice uh, in this one over on the left-hand side, the, the lowest level is a, a unit um, on the specific topics. And unfortunately, with a unit perspective, um, when you assign that, it's going to give them quite a large bit of material that, that it may go above and beyond the specific um, subject or topic that they're learning about. So we're still working with our uh, vendors to try to streamline and make these in a more usable f format for us. Um, uh, the final piece that uh, we've been working with is the one roster integration. Uh, so many, uh, so many things are generated and um, and pushed out from our student information system. We use Infinite Campus for our student information system. As with all with all of you, uh, we re rely on that to uh, populate any type of applications with students, courses, rosters, um, login information, assessment content, um, and. We have one specific person in our district that really works on any type of applications um, where we need to integrate with. Now the challenging part, just as many of you also see, is that uh, some of them might support a, a single sign-on or an um, Active Directory connection. Others may not where support that, and we have to just provide them with a, a standard username um, and, and uh, allow the creation account creation aspect to ha be handled on their end. We currently have uh, probably about eight to ten different exports that we do for districts or for, for companies that are, are still working on um, uh, at some other type of an automated process along the way. We've automated many of those areas. So the one area that we're really looking forward to benefiting the most from is the one roster integration. Um, ideally, uh, with that is Infinite Campus supports the one roster integration. Um, then any other companies as they're coming on board supporting that as well, we would still just have that one specific one roster integration that would be connected to. Um, so there's no more building, in, building out multiple integration um, files uh, for that standpoint. Another big key area that our district and our teachers have been talking about for the last five years really also comes down to the piece of getting assignment grades back into our student information system. So with the one roster integration, that should actually create that, that, that bi-directional flow of information um, that we're so desperate, desperately looking forward to. Um, I know there are a lot of variations and struggles when you're looking at um, uh, class assignments flowing back and forth within the student information system. Uh, we've been, uh, it's learning, I know, and Infinite Campus have been working together uh, into try, trying to uh, work that process out, and I've seen a demo that uh, they're moving along along the way. They still have some work to do. But again, I think that next piece will be that tra transformational, at least from um, an administrative standpoint in a teacher's classroom, um, uh, success when teachers no longer have to duplicate the grades uh, once in a learning management system, and then again into our student information system to enter the grades. So uh, that's one of the key areas that we are currently focusing on, um, making sure that we have that, um, that bi-directional one roster integration. Uh, that will streamline a lot of processes, not only in our student information side, but also in the classroom as well. Um, from a future plan standpoint, we're uh, looking at building out visual analytics dashboards uh, so that um, as we are integrating not only content and resources, uh, but we're also integrating um, data that comes along with that um, so that we can put that in the hands of the, the folks that can use it most and benefit from that. Um, so from a distance perspective, that's where we are in a nutshell and the, the next directions on where we're heading to. So. Jill, I'll pass that over to you. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, both Mike and Mike, uh, for sharing with us. Kara, I'm just going to stop here and see if you have any questions we should address. Yes, we do. A few questions came in. Actually, um, Mike Evans, they were uh, during your part of the presentation, but I would imagine they could um, be directed to both panelists. So first question, how do you get your assessment results into your gradebook? Currently, our, uh, our assessment platform uh, has an API integration back into our learning management system. Um, and we were really striving for that integration so that we can bring the standards uh, into the learning platform where teachers could then evaluate and recommend content aligned to the standards. So that is actually done through an API between the two vendors. Uh, we do not, uh, have not found a way yet um, bringing it back into our student information system, but I think that again will be right around the corner uh, as we build out, uh, or one roster gets built out, and I believe, and, and Jill may be able to speak to this more, but um, with the next uh, update 1.1 for one roster, there may be some enhanced uh, capabilities along those lines, but uh, that's what we're waiting on for that standpoint. Okay, and then an additional question. What assessment or system are you using or plan to use? We currently are using LearningStation uh, as our assessment platform. Um, we also have a, uh, have just gone through an RFP process um, and uh, has a selection has been made, but it has not been named yet. But um, if anyone wants to email me, uh, in a week, then I'll be able to let, let that known. And currently in Volusia, we have, um, we use a product called Edgeforia, and uh, our grade book is at the moment, I believe it's Wazzle, um, but names change often. But um, as we go for the RFP for our SIS, that's one of our, um, one of our big uh, functional requirements is for that grade book and that integrated piece so we can pull from our LMS directly into at the moment. Okay, and then additional questions came in, um, and I know Mike Cicchetti answered um, him from his perspective, um, how are you using um, to, how are you using IMS standards to send rosters to the 100 districts that you use to send CSV files? So, Mike, did you want to add on to any of the response that you sent through the Q&A already? I, I, don't, I don't know if that was uh, available for everyone to see. I don't know if I sent it privately or open, but uh, regardless. Um, for Volusia, one thing that we have found uh, tremendously helpful, one, um, partnering with and joining IMS, but also joining our uh, local consortiums and uh, some nationwide and uh, international Consortiums, you get to have these discussions. You know, um, Mike Evans and I are, are looking to do a presentation at the IMS um, leadership meeting out uh, coming in May already. Um, and what's nice is when you have these open conversations with not only other districts inside your state but around the country and around the world, it opens up to know um, that you're not the only one either seeing the issues or uh, not the only one that uh, this is occurring to. So with vendors when we have uh, requests it's nice to know what others have tried others have done and others have been successful or failed at because you can have those conversations then with your account representatives from those vendors and state when you know for a fact someone has had it done successfully and you wish to have the same opportunities that the other county district or state has had afforded to them so i could say as much as possible communicate um, outside your district, outside your state even, and find out from uh, those that are your, your counterparts that uh, what they've attempted and what they've tried. Uh, that's been the biggest success, I think, for Volusia is we didn't try to solve everything ourselves. When, when we attempted to do so, it did not go so well. So uh, expanding and communicating has been key. Okay, and Mike Evans, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think you nailed it right on, right on target. 
Okay. Um, final question for right now. How do you target segments of your roster to a vendor, say for K-5 to schools only? So depending on the uh, the vendor and the integration type, um, that's uh, from a uh, CSV uh, FTP standpoint where we're automating that. Uh, that's all built through our nightly uh, roster integrations through our student information system. Um, if I'm understanding the, qu the question correctly, um, so we'll build. Uh, uh, SQL scripts that will isolate the specific grade levels um, for the roster integrations. Um, and then from the one roster component, uh, everything would be built within the one roster component, but then the, it's, uh, what the district would, or the vendors would be utilizing would be defined um, for the specs that they would need. Yep. Yep, I would ditto that. Okay, great. Um, thank you both. Um, Jill, nothing else for now. All right. So uh, a couple of other things I was going to ask you guys to react to. Uh, one is both of you talked a lot about the technologies behind making these integrations happen. Um, and that's a critical piece of how we get it done. It seems to me that in order for this to truly be um, effective or bought into, you need um, others in your district to agree that you're all headed in the same direction towards adopting certain kinds of technologies. Can, can both of you talk about from your own perspective how you went about gaining that kind of consensus across department lines? Mike C, you want to start? Sure, yeah, I can start. Um, to, to build a consensus, I, I mentioned that um, I'm fortunate enough to have a standing appointment uh, for over the last two years with our principals, APs, and instructional services. So basically, the departments that have an impact on our students and teachers, uh, less so much on the uh, HR finance side, but inside of those, there still are standards that we work toward, but those don't necessarily have that instructional impact um, like the rest of the department. So uh, realistically, when we uh, get the buy-in, it was demonstrating what was occurring in the past compared to what was the future, so to speak. So for example, the uh, demonstration that we had when we had our, our original SSO provider was the time-consuming portion to have a student log in, not just once, but twice, and not just twice, sometimes three times, to get into a resource. And what it would involve the teacher to do um, that really didn't have the instructional impact that they were looking to have. It was more maintenance and care uh, just to get in. So they, they lost a lot of instructional minutes um, the old way. And then we demonstrated the new way. And with the new way, we put together the uh, that pretty much that equation that I mentioned, the LMS SSO, where we talk about the acronyms and the benefit of the acronyms, not necessarily the vendor or the product, so to speak, because those can become interchangeable over time. And so we really want to clarify what single sign-on does for the instructional time, the instructional value, whether you're on campus or off. And then we uh, were able to display it. So it really came into uh, do a real-life scenario and put it to the T. And that's what allowed uh, those that were not so technology-inclined to understand, you know, the things that they don't get to see in the back end, what occurs back in the SIS and the programming and developer world, they don't need to see that. They just need to know that if I click here, my resource is here, and it's going to align and tie me to, you know, my staff, my teacher, my room. Um, so it was really just doing demonstrations and examples to really get them to understand uh, the impact that we're seeing from the assistance of IMS and others and um, where we need to move forward as we move into the digital world. From uh, for Scythe's perspective, uh, very similar. I think the key um, – the key component to uh, gaining consensus across the district lines for us would be collaboration. Um, we have a, our uh, director of instructional technology um, attends every single department meeting for the teaching and learning department. Um, and if he's not there, we have representation uh, for those. Um, we're meeting with our special ed departments, our student support uh, departments, to make sure that um, that 
they are aware of the specific needs as they're looking at content providers or if um, they're looking at new applications that they want to bring on board um, to make sure that, uh, that we have representation to talk through uh, the different challenges and parameters um, that, um, that go beyond the, the glitz and glamour of it looking great in the classroom and the effectiveness of it. Um, one of the challenges that we dealt with this past year um, was uh, when the protocols were not followed, a new application was brought on board, um, and they did not make us aware of it until June that they had subscribed to um, uh, another application. Uh, it wasn't until later in June, almost into July, before they even got us the specs of what the integration files looked like. They weren't one roster. Um, well, during our summertime, our student information system team is uh, you know, fast at work at readying everything else for, for back to school. So there are some frustrations from the teaching and learning standpoint because we truly were not even able to get that, um, that application up and running until uh, several weeks into school. So um, that just reinforced um, the, the collaborative nature and the collaborative needs that we have as a district um, to them that we need to make sure that we're on board and uh, engaged along the way. Um, so recently we just uh, reintroduced the, the fact that if you do have applications along the way, make sure that we're involved in that process um, and gave them the timelines for when we would need any type of integration um, specs uh, if they want to have that for back to school. Perfect. Thanks. So. If you were, um, you know, a, a district looking to get started and, and just finding out about this, what kind of advice would you give to that district as a first step? Um, I would say, uh, and I said I mentioned it before, but um, instead of looking to reinvent the wheel or, or try and head it on yourself and figure out all the answers yourself, I would reach out to either uh, Mike and myself or um, neighboring districts. Really, it's that conversation you can have with someone who's already been through the process to give you the the lowdown. Um, but, you know, the great thing about technology, though, is it is ever changing. So the district that you may talk with this year had success this year, and there's something brand new that you're looking to implement, and they may also be in the same role. So you can either um, have a great joint conversation around how you would like to approach it, but you're not necessarily alone. Um, so I would just say for those that are looking for that first step, it's re reaching out to neighboring districts or um, looking at consortiums like one IMS or two if you have one inside of your state, like Florida has the uh, uh, FICL group, our Florida Council of Instructional Technology Leaders, and that's been very helpful because you basically have a seat at the table to have those conversations. So it would be uh, reach out. The same exact thing that was as I was jotting down notes, power in many, so um, listen and learn from others that have gone through what what you're looking at doing. Great, thank you. Um, so one other question and and um, Mike Evans, if you don't mind, um, maybe you could pass the ball back my way while we're doing this. Um, do you include? language in uh, the kinds of RFPs that you're doing now to uh, be able to ensure your vision is becoming reality? We do in the, I don't have a specific language because we had our instructional team had written up the RFP for that one, but within the assessment platform, um, that we had just created the RFP for, uh, had gone through that one. Um, that's one of the areas that we're looking at, the interoperability uh, of that one, which would have been through the, the LTI components um, and the one roster components as well. So that's, we figure it's a lot easier getting and addressing it on the front end before we sign them on as a vendor while they're still um, buying for our business than, um, than after the fact along the way. So yes, we do incorporate that language into our uh, specific uh, RFPs we're looking for. Yep. And um, on our side too, and I can also, I could send you this as well, um, Jill, so you can share out, but we, we also took a document that was created um, 
in, con in uh, conjunction, Matt Frey, who's now over in Texas, but he was down in Brevard for the longest time, Brevard County in Florida, um, had, a, had a group called FACS, uh, now it's the Federated ACT, um, and they had a, a document they had, they had started, and it was calling for specific, you know, LTI, common cartridge, one roster, single sign-on, and they spelled it out to a T, and what we did in Volusia was we took that, made sure we keep up to date with new versions that are coming out with LTI and one roster, and we have that during our adoption and, um, um, yeah, basically our adoption phase, like right now we're in our social studies phase, so this document is going through for its first time with vendors looking to come into Volusia County and provide their resources. And we also added the AIM and UDL accessibility requirements on there as well. So that way um, we're trying to address not just the ease of access and ease of rostering, but also the ease of use for all of our students, not just um, what some would consider the majority. Um, so I could share this as well, and it could be tweaked and done with whatever needs to occur, but it's been helpful so far for this first uh, adoption that we're looking to use it with. Great, thank you. So just to address the the slide that's on screen now, um, both Mike and Mike have talked about how valuable it is to work with other districts, and that really is the goal of IMS, to bring together like-minded organizations, the power of our combined voice to speak to the marketplace is uh, extremely valuable and important. It does help create uh, the impetus for suppliers to be able to make the developmental changes that w we're asking for. So we have a call to action uh, for all districts to consider, all, all K-12 districts to consider, um, something for you to consider making yourself be a part of this uh, document to say, hey, we believe that it's important that you provide us with the kinds of interoperable tools and applications and software that really make uh, our, our educational ecosystem work better. I encourage you to take a look at that, and I'm going to put the link in the chat for you. And with that, Kara, I think we have uh, another question or two coming in. We do. We have uh, at least one additional question, and I think we just have about enough time for it. Um, so Mike and Mike, it's a, a two-parter. Uh, do you do anything with social emotional learning? And if so, um, how would the standards uh, from IMS Global fit into this initiative? Um, in, in terms of so for social emotional, um, I'm just trying to think about the the realm in which that falls under so I can better better address that question. Social emotional is that falling in the ESE category, so to speak? I would say that social emotional learning would probably be um, you know, kind of in the um, area of uh, counseling, uh, behavioral intervention, um, it would be uh, the kinds of things to do with extending uh, beyond the academic learning. Okay. Well, I'd say in, in Volusia, um, for the most part, we haven't dealt with uh, specific vendors for resources that would allow our counseling and our school psychologists and um, social workers as well. Um, to need so much so rostering and or uh, single sign-on. Uh, most of our solutions there are homegrown, home-built by the programmers that we have. Um, but I could say in that same realm where it's non-instructional, um, I mean, uh, just taking it a, a step further, but um, would kind of address that as vendors will come to bat for um, unique fitments like the social-emotional side. Um, we have a high school football coach who's looking to use a product that was developed inside of a helmet to address concussions and where that's not an instructional impact uh, piece of technology inside the classroom, it has a technology aspect that requires rostering of the players and so on and so forth and those companies have never, ever considered or thought about rostering similar to the very first realm of education resources. So. They were not aware of IMS, they were not aware of one roster, they were not aware of 
uh, their customers, so to speak, and the work that's going to go involved with, you know, adding students and players and information. And so having those conversations with even a group like them has been uh, eye-opening for them, but uh, great for those that have been requesting it, um, you know, non-instructional, non but still applicable. Yeah, similar for us, it would, uh, the, the programs or in the initiatives that we deal with from a social and emotional learning aspect, um, we, we use uh, seven mindsets all throughout the district in many of the schools. And um, from that standpoint, uh, not necessarily a, a computer application versus a program, but um, any of those areas that might delve into that component would just be uh, interoperability. Um, if it is an application or something that they're looking at utilizing, um, then we would just look at how it would integrate within our current platform, student information and learning management platform. But interoperability is going to be the key uh, piece to anything that we're looking at. Okay, great. I think we're all set for questions. I know we're just coming to the top of the hour. Um, thank you very much. I'll, I'll let Jill end. Before I do, just a reminder to everyone, um, if you attended today, we will be following up and sending a link to the um, resources from today's presentation along with the link to the recording. And uh, also um, a short survey that uh, would be really helpful, and I promise uh, we kept it short and sweet, um, but we would appreciate your feedback um, in that survey and if you could complete it. So, um, Jill, if you want to close. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate so much our two presenters today for sharing your vision and experience and journey along the way with all of our attendees. Thank you, attendees, for being with us today, and we hope we'll see you again in our next webinar, which will be at the beginning of May. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.